Hi, my name is Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the RPOD 179 today. We're going to start right up front here with your coupling and uncoupling process. Uh, what that's going to look like for you is uh, you're going to start out with the coupler in the unlocked position here. Uh, we're going to then go ahead and raise the jack three inches above our ball and drop. We're then going to, of course, center our ball and drop underneath the coupler. We then go ahead and lower that jack on top of the ball and drop. Uh, from there, we can go ahead and lock this back. Now, once we lock that back, what we're looking for is um, this secondary locking mechanism to be fully engaged. Uh, we want to make sure uh, that once we, we set this back, we go ahead and we give it a pull upwards to make sure that it is in fact locked on. Now you do have a pin here. You can go ahead and, and pin that. That's going to give you an added safety function there. Uh, that's going to keep that from potentially rattling loose or anything like that. Uh, so once you're fully locked on here, you can go ahead and run the jack all the way into the up position here. Uh, from there, tow chains are going to need to be crossed underneath the coupler and attached to the receiver. Now it is very important, a couple things. Uh, in Texas, it is state law that these chains do have to be crossed. They also, uh, it is illegal for them to make contact with the payment at any time. So what you're going to do is you're going to be skating that line in between the two. So you want to have enough room to go ahead and make your turns left or right, but you also want to uh, make sure that these are not going to make any contact with the pavement. So crossed underneath the coupler, going to ride something like that. Right beside those tow chains, we're going to have your emergency breakaway cable running with a separate connection. Now, this emergency breakaway cable is your last line of defense if these other couplers were to fail or if this coupler were to fail, it, it broke your tow chains. As the two vehicles separate, this is going to act like a ripcord to the electric brake system, essentially locking that up immediately. So, very, very important that this is on a third connection point on the receiver. Whether that's a, whether that's a quick link or a carabiner, you're gonna go ahead and make sure you do uh, connect that properly. Uh, up top here, we have your electric tongue jack. You have up or down operation when it comes to the jack here, and you have a light that's going to give you a point of reference if you're backing up to it in the dark, uh, but up or down operation on the jack here, very straightforward. Up top here, we have your manual drive. Uh, inside the unit, you're going to find a crank handle. That's going to allow you to manually operate the jack in the event of a power loss situation. Uh, other than that, very easily, uh, easily usable. Uh, again, up or down operation, very straightforward. Uh, beside that or behind that, we have your propane tank. Now this is a 20 pound propane cylinder, uh, open and close valve on the top. I find most people are generally familiar with the use of these. Uh, this is held in place with a tension band and a wing nut here. And this is all completely covered with this propane container when going down the use or going down the road. Uh, now orientation of this container is going to be uh, with the, the door uh, facing uh, this way. Uh, that way the wind doesn't catch this door and open it up when you're going down the road. You see a little hole there on the back and we have a little stud here. Now that is so that, uh, propane, can that propane container can uh, sit there on the stud and you're going to go ahead and, and lock this wing nut down that's going to keep that from blowing off going down the road. Uh, behind that we have a brand new interstate D-cycle battery. A uh, little bit of maintenance that, that, that comes with that battery. Since it is a lead acid battery, two or three times a year we're going to go ahead and we're going to pull these vent panels. We're going to refill with distilled water as necessary. So there's a clear marked water line. It is just very important that we do go ahead uh, and maintain that water level. Now these R pods, they don't come standard with a battery disconnect switch. Uh, so what that means for you as a consumer for periods of long-term storage, you're gonna have to physically disconnect these battery terminals uh, and go ahead and, and either let the battery lay, go ahead and pull the battery out, store in a more temperature controlled environment. Either way, uh, it is very important uh, that we do that because that's gonna keep that battery in, in the best shape possible during storage. With any 12 volt system, you're gonna have nominal or phantom draws on that system uh, that are gonna wear and tear on the battery, generally compounded over many, many months in storage. So something to keep in mind there if you are storing the unit for long periods of time. Uh, coming around here to the side, uh, now we have stabilizer jacks on all four corners of the unit. 
Again, on the inside, we're going to find a crank handle to go ahead and fit over this three quarter inch drive nut here. We're gonna come down, we're gonna make contact with the pavement uh, just a little bit further. Now, it goes without saying that these are for stabilization, they're not for leveling. So if we're leveling from front to back, we're gonna use that main tongue jack up front. Leveling from left to right is gonna be done with the tires and your choice of a leveling kit. So you have a lot of different options. You'll figure out which one makes the most sense for you. But once you are level, you're then gonna go ahead and run down these stabilizer jacks to stabilize the floor, keep it from feeling like you're walking around on the suspension. Um, you will be best suited for in the long term if you kind of use a light touch with those. Come down, make contact with the pavement, quarter turn more. Same on the way up, once you're all the way up, quarter turn more, just to sure everything up. Again, uh, as they age, as that powder coat kind of wears off, we want them to go ahead and use a light touch. Uh, now, we're gonna skip over your water heater for just a second. We're gonna talk about these water sources because it's gonna make uh, a little bit more sense when we talk about the draining procedure of the water heater. So, up top here, we have your potable water fill. That's gonna be how you fill that onboard water tank. Uh, just go ahead and stick a drinking water hose directly into the uh, tank fill. Fill that up to it overflows. Once, we fit, once we're full, we cap it off. Uh, we do need to use the onboard water pump to pressurize that system and draw that up to the fixtures. So uh, very easy. The switch for that 12 volt water pump is going to be switched on on the inside. We'll of course get eyes on it when we do make our way to that area. Uh, below that we have your city water connection. Now city water is pressurized directly from the line. Uh, more often than not it is over pressurized. So it is very important that we do regulate the water pressure going into the unit. We're going to do so. Uh, with a water pressure regulator. Now this particular water pressure regulator is going to keep that water pressure in between 40 and 50 psi. Now these units uh, are designed to have an upwards working pro uh, a working water pressure of 40 to 50 or excuse me 40 to 75 psi. So if for whatever reason um, this is not enough water pressure for you, feel free to upgrade to either an adjustable water pressure regulator or a high flow water pressure regulator. Uh, as long as you're not exceeding that 75 PSI threshold, you're going to be in great shape. With any water pressure regulator, it hooks directly onto the spigot side of the hose. And then we go ahead and we hook your water or we hook your hose to that. And then we hook your, the other side of your hose to the trailer by rotating the trailer bound connection here. Very straightforward, very easy to do. Uh, again, Always want to run with a water pressure regulator. If this gets lost, damaged, stolen, whatever, uh, make sure you're replacing it before you take the unit out again. So it is very, very important. Uh, now jumping back over here to the water heater. So the reason why I brought these to your attention first is because we're going to talk about the manufacturer's recommendation when it does come to the water heater. Uh, so starting out, this is a six gallon capacity water heater. It is dual source, runs on 110 volt electricity. Uh, as well as propane with 12 volt direct, smart, direct spark ignition. Um, manufacturer has two very specific recommendations when it does come to maintaining the unit. Number one is gonna be draining the unit if it's gonna be in storage for more than seven days. And number two is going to be when returning the unit back to service, we do need to feed six gallons of water to the unit or prime it before we light it. We wanna avoid lighting this with an empty tank at all costs. So, Backing up a little bit when it comes to draining it, um, those steps are gonna look something like this. You're of course gonna give it ample time to cool down, at least two or three hours generally. Uh, from there, once you're fairly certain of the temperature, we need to depressurize it. So the, there, there's a couple ways to depressurize it, but the easiest for you is gonna be using the hot side of any fixture within the unit. So whether that's an outside shower, whether that's the bathroom sink, kitchen sink, whatever, we're gonna use that hot side of the, of the fixture. So with all that in mind, we're gonna cut the inlet flow of water to the unit completely. Again, if that's city water connection, we're gonna physically turn the valve off at the water source. If it's, uh, or you know, physically disconnect the hose here. If it's potable water, we're just gonna turn off the water pump uh, on the inside. So once we've cut that flow of, uh, that inlet flow of water to the unit, we're then going to open the hot side of any fixture up that it's going to blow off that excess pressure, it's going to dispel a small amount of water from the fixture, but what it's doing is it is releasing the pressure within the tank. 
So once that pressure is released, we're gonna come down here with an inch and a sixteenth socket and ratchet, and we're gonna go ahead and back that drain plug out. Now, uh, on the end of this drain plug, so this is not only a drain plug, but it is also an anode rod, so it does pull double duty. Uh, and that is on the other side. Now what an anode rod does is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit onto the end of that anode rod as opposed to the inside of the water heater. Uh, it is a consumable part. I would expect to get a year or two in between anode rod changes. Uh, or a camping season or two dependent on use. So the more you use it, the quicker it's gonna go. Uh, when it does come to replacing that anode rod, you're going to replace the drain plug as well. It is sold as one, uh, is sold as one complete assembly and you will just take measurements in terms of length to uh, find the, the correct part to replace it with. Uh, other than that, on the flip side of that conversation, again, manufacturer recommends that you do replace that water when you are returning the unit uh, to storage. That procedure is going to look very similar to draining it, but essentially the exact opposite. So we are going to uh, introduce an inflow of water to the unit. Again, city water connection, just turn on the valve, potable water, turn on the water pump. Once we have water flowing to the inlet of the unit, of course, our drain plug and anode rod has been replaced. Uh, we are then going to, uh, again, use the hot side of any spigot or fixture. We're going to turn that hot side on. Now, initially, that flow is going to be very airy, very spitty, as it dispels the air within the tank and replaces it with water. Now, once that flow normalizes at your fixture that you are using to prime the water heater, that is generally your indicator that it is ready for service. You can go ahead and, and uh, apply power or or um, you know, allow that direct spark ignition to light the propane side of things. Uh, so that's how you drain and fill the water heater. Uh, now when it comes to using the water heater to actually heat some water, you have a couple options. Uh, on the underside here, and it, it's very hard to find, but it is a little toggle switch. If you didn't know it was there, you may miss it. Uh, on or off is clearly marked. Now that's going to be for the 110 volt uh, heating element there um, and and the biggest kind of thing I find with that is that people forget to turn it off uh, when they go to drain the unit so make sure you're turning it off when you're done using it uh, this is again going to be what you're going to use in the capacity of an RV tar any an RV park anytime you have full-time access to electricity you'd probably be best suited going ahead and using that electric heating element now the propane side of things uh, the switch for that direct spark ignition is going to be found on the inside. They separate the switches, although you can feel free to use both sources at the same time. That's actually going to give you the highest recharge rate. Uh, next up in terms of efficiency is going to be propane. Lastly is going to be electric. So uh, switch for that unit for the electrics or for the propane side of things is going to be on the inside. Again, we're going to point that out when we get to the inside. You'll see that. Uh, only other thing to really talk about with this unit is going to be the importance of protecting it from flying insects and mud daubers from nesting within the appliance. To do so, we are going to uh, use a bug screening material to go ahead and screen this grating in these louvers. Now, they sell specifically cut screens on the aftermarket uh, to assist with that, but that's a valid recommendation whether you want to get crafty and DIY something, whatever. Our goal is to keep mud divers from uh, nesting within the appliance. So however you accommodate that uh, is up to you. Just make sure that these are as free flowing as possible while still protecting them. Uh, while I have this door up, uh, we're gonna have to get low to see some things, but we have a drain plug here on the bottom. That's going to be how you drain that freshwater holding tank. We talked about how to fill it on the top side here, uh, but you just go ahead and you remove that plug. It's a gravity feed system that's going to go ahead and drain that uh, tank completely. And then beside that, we have the storage place for your uh, septic hose or your black water hose. Now this does run the full width of the camper. It can just about accommodate any sized hose. Uh, it is accessible from both sides. And again, it is just a storage place for your hose uh, to keep you from having to store that nasty hose with all of your other stuff. Uh, very straightforward, just has a door on each side. Now we talked about your uh, water connections here. We're gonna go ahead and move over to the furnace here. Uh, now this uh, is your propane burning furnace. Again, has direct spark ignition. 
Um, from this area here, it's not what we would consider a customer serviceable unit. Uh, just not too terribly much you're going to be doing with this unit. It's a sealed unit as well. Uh, again, if you have any issues, bring it to an RV dealer and they'll sort you out. Uh, one thing you can do is make sure you let it breathe. You're not going to want to restrict the flow. Don't put a lawn chair up in front of it, whatever. Keep it free breathing. Uh, also, again, same lines as the water heater. This is a huge intrusion point for mud daubers, flying insects, things like that. They love to crawl as deep within the appliance as they can, uh, build their dirt nest uh, within it, uh, leaving it inoperable. So uh, easiest thing to do in those scenarios is going to be prevention. So keep that in mind. Uh, we do want to keep them from nesting within the unit. Uh, one thing down low here we're going to talk about before jumping up and talking about slide out maintenance is going to be your sewer outlet connection here. Now this in particular is going to be your black water dump valve. Um, they separate with these Forest River R pods, they separate the plumbing uh, and this is going to be your black water. Now black water is anything that comes from the toilet. So any toilet waste, body waste, things of that nature, they're going to be dispelled from this location here. Now it is very important with the black water that we keep that valve in the closed position and we're going to use the monitor panel on the inside and we're only going to dump as necessary. It's very important because we have not only solid body waste but we have toilet paper in there as well and again we want to, we want to keep that from compounding, we want to keep that as free flowing as possible and the only way to do that is by keeping this valve in the closed position. So we're either going to dump when that tank fills or if we're changing locations. Um, and again, that goes even when you are hooked up to full-time septic. Now your sewage hose and your cap are going to connect the very same way. Uh, you see these four prongs here on the outside of the housing. We then just put that keyhole in the halfway position, give it a quarter turn, that locks it on. That's going to keep anything from uh, coming out when in travel. And also, same rule of thumb for your sewage hose there. Now when it does come to dumping this, this, this is just a six inch pull towards the rear of the camper. Uh, nothing too crazy, you don't have to twist it. You know, just is just a six inch pull uh, towards the rear there. Uh, jumping up here to the slide out. Um, so this unit utilizes the Schwintech slide out system. Uh, what that means for you is that uh, you have two tracks here, top to bottom, left to right. You have two independently geared motors that push that slide in and out. Uh, it is very important from a maintenance standpoint that we do go ahead and lubricate those tracks. So two or three times a year, we're going to, or every 90 days, we're gonna go ahead and lubricate these tracks. What we're gonna use is a dry silicone lubricant, uh, PTFE products, anything like that, as long as it is a dry silicone lubricant, is going to do the job here. We're going to go ahead and spray each track down. Again, we have tracks top to bottom, left to right. We're going to lubricate all tracks, run that slide in two or three times to distribute that lubricant. We're going to be in good shape. Uh, also, on that same maintenance schedule, we do need to condition these seals. Now, these seals run all the way around the slide out, and then you have a second set of seals on the inside because that slide seals in both directions. We're going to use an RV grade seal conditioner and we're going to go ahead and spray those seals down. Of course, we're ultimately going to follow the directions on the product that we're using, but generally those products will let you, uh, they will have you, um, have you allow that product to sit for a few minutes, wiping off any excess, and then essentially you're good for the next 90 days. Very, very important to keep this slide out functioning properly that we do follow those maintenance procedures. Uh, also, a uh, good time as any to talk about overall unit maintenance. Uh, now, what we have here is, is again, this 90-day maintenance schedule for, for really just about everything in the unit is a good habit to adopt. Uh, we're going to give it, uh, when, we're, when we're going ahead and we're treating our, uh, lubricating our slides and, and treating our seals, we're going to also do a 360-degree inspection top and bottom of the unit in general. Anywhere on the body where two pieces come together, there's going to be used, they're going to use a 100% silicone product, 100% um, silicone product to seal that. So uh, it's our goal every 90 days to inspect those uh, connection points where they have used some sort of sealant and make sure we don't see any degradation, any cracking, any peeling, anything like that. 
And again, on the body, you're generally going to find a 100% silicone product, and that's what we're going to use to maintain it. On the roof, they use a lap sealant, so a self-leveling lap sealant. Generally, the big name is Dicor. Uh, generally, again, you have to source those from an RV dealer, but we're looking for the same thing. Any cracking, any peeling, any degradation, we're going to touch up as necessary, and you might as well just source both of those products from the same location, which is going to be an RV dealer or a parts house. Uh, moving on, we have tire pressure and lug nuts. Now these lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot-pounds here in the shop. Uh, manufacturer's recommendation with any unit that we deliver is going to be a retorque procedure. So what that's going to entail is the first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. It is very important that we do go ahead and retorque those down to 100 foot-pounds, make sure they're not working themselves loose, make sure that they are again maintaining that level of torque. Manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip there on after, that we do go ahead and retorque them down to 100 foot pounds. Very, very, very important that we do uh, follow those rules. Uh, now, in terms of tire pressure, when we are talking about any trailer tire, you run trailer tires at the max tire pressure rating. That is stamped at the traditional location on the sidewall of the tires. You would find it with any vehicle, but it is also stamped uh, or written on this data tag forward here. So with this particular, uh, with these particular tires, we run those at 65 PSI. That's the max tire pressure rating that gives you the highest flexibility in terms of weight rating, whether you're completely full or completely empty, that 65 PSI is going to be a great number for you. Uh, again, moving on, a little tight here on space, but we have your refrigerator compartment here. Uh, now, from a maintenance standpoint, not too terribly much that, this, that you're going to be doing with this unit. Uh, again, this kind of falls into that category of not really being customer serviceable, uh, but there are some things you can do to make uh, the appliance last longer or, or you know, um, keep it from needing to be maintained at all, essentially. So, number one is going to be, again, protecting the, these vents from mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, you have vents top and bottom. Again, it's our goal to protect those uh, from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Number two, give it a visual inspection a couple times a year. Remove the vent panel, take a look at the wiring, make sure you're not seeing any frayed wiring, cracked propane lines, anything like that. Uh, just, just visually look at it. If it looks good for you, then it's probably in good shape. Uh, when removing that vent or putting it back on, you are going to go ahead and put the tabs up first. So they are seated, they have little slots there for the tabs. We put that up first. We make sure that these are in line here. Once that vent is flush with the opening, we go ahead and lock it on by turning these tabs here. Uh, once you're certain that you've locked it on, go ahead and just give it a test. Make sure that it is in fact locked on. That's gonna keep you from losing one of these vents by going down the road. Uh, squeezing past here. Uh, down low here, and I'll let you kind of catch up here. Down low here, we have your, uh, so forward, I guess, I guess if right by the tire, I don't know if you can see that. That's okay. So, so up front here, we have your low point drains. Now these are the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. So we're gonna use these um, to drain the to and from plumbing. So everything in between water source and fixture is gonna be drained via these two. Lines here, they do have valves, and just like with any valve, if you're against the flow, you're off. With the flow, you're on. Uh, we're going to use those not only for winterization, but for just good general maintenance. We want to go ahead and drain those lines, uh, keep, them, uh, keep them nice and clear. Again, anytime the unit's going to be in storage for more than seven days, we need to do so. So that procedure, kind of to bring it all home, is we're going to start with the freshwater tank if it's been in use. Uh, then we're going to come down here, we're going to open up these low point drains, let that water drain out. And then lastly, we're going to drain the water heater the, the, using the process that we talked about previously. Uh, and then here we have your gray water tank, or gray water dump valve I should say, uh, operates exactly like the black water that we talked about previously, although this one dumps by pulling a six inch pool towards the front of the camper. Uh, cap attaches the very same way. Uh, and you will need a separate septic hose to accommodate dumping uh, this valve here. Uh, moving on, cable satellite inlets here. Uh, this is just a 
standard RG6 cable fitting, pass-through cable connection to the designated TV area, uh, meant to accommodate a park cable service or an aftermarket satellite package. Um, excuse me. Um, you know, nothing too crazy there. It is just a pass-through connection. So it allows you to feed uh, cable or satellite services uh, to the inside of the unit. Uh, right beside there, we have your 30 amp, 110 volt power supply. That only plugs into the unit one way. If we go ahead and look at the plug itself, uh, it, it is only gonna make sense that it is accommodated one way. You have one L-shaped prong, or one L-shaped uh, receptacle. If we go ahead and line that up with the L-shaped prong, it's gonna plug straight in. It's gonna be an eighth inch turn to the right there that locks it in. Then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down, lock it in further. It's gonna be my recommendation with any unit that I deliver, very, very important to go ahead and add a 30 amp surge protector um, in line. So generally with those surge protectors, they're gonna plug directly into the power source. You have a lot of, of sensitive electronics going on within the unit and a surge protector is truly the number one thing you can do to protect your uh, investment further. Now. If you have any questions on which products to buy, the further importance of using those products, um, you know, any of those things, feel free to give our parts department a call. They'd be more than happy to educate you, again, further in the importance, or at least let you know which products to, to start looking at. Uh, up top here, we have an outside shower, access to hot and cold water, does have a hanger there. Uh, you know, really nothing too crazy or, or, or uh, out of the realm of understanding here. Uh, it is self-contained. This hose will coil around that fixture. Does store under key there. Again, nothing too crazy. Does have an on-off switch on the head uh, in the event to help you conserve uh, water usage. So again, nothing that I'm going to focus on too much. Very straightforward. Uh, here on the rear, uh, again, nothing too, too crazy. We have your uh, tail lights, marker lights, uh, license plate and brackets. Um, Rear stabilizer jacks, we've kind of already talked about a lot of this stuff, but we do have your spare tire here. Now this does carry a full, uh, full size spare tire. It's gonna be on a steel rim. Uh, one thing to remember when we do come, when it does come to changing a tire, uh, it's very important on where we place that jack. So of course the unit itself does not come with a jack. So you're going to, uh, number one, make sure the jack that is included with your tow vehicle is going to accommodate this vehicle. Uh, once you're sure of that, uh, you're going to then place that jack directly on the axle as close to the tire as you can without it interfering in your work. And then you're going to, of course, change the tire from that location. Um, up to you on whether you place your uh, flattened tire, your blown tire back here onto the mount. Uh, but again, this is to help you uh, not be stranded going down the road, essentially. Uh, moving on. Um, you know, really nothing too, too crazy here as well. Uh, I like to call this stuff kind of the usual suspects. We have a standard assist handrail, locks in that out position for use, can either fold against the body or fold against the door uh, for travel, uh, whatever you prefer. Again, we're talking about preferences here. There is no right or wrong. Uh, standard RV style flip step, which means that the bottom is going to flip up and that the uh, rest then just kind of slides in. Uh, same on the way out, out and down. Uh, we have your black tank flush here. Now, these black tank flushes, they're, they're excellent additions, uh, huge upgrades that we see pretty much standard on most models these days. What this is, is this corresponds with a, a jet inside the black water tank. Now what that jet does is it is specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, this is, uh, so, so you're gonna hook any old garden hose, any old dirty hose into this, and we're going to use that to clean out the black water tank. Now it does have some limitations to it. So if you were to hook up water flushing, or water rushing into the unit with that black water valve in the closed position, uh, it's going to overflow that tank and essentially the path of least resistance is going to be the rooftop septic vents. So of course that is something we, we definitely want to avoid there. So what I recommend my customers, if you do choose to keep that black water valve in the closed position while utilizing the black tank flush, of course that's going to give you the, the, the most rinsing action. Uh, if you choose to do that, 
Do not let water rush in there for more than five minutes, number one. And uh, periodically check the monitor panel on the inside while doing so, making sure you are not going to overflow that tank. Once you're fairly certain of the level of full, you run around to the other side, you relieve that pressure with the blade X valve, you're going to go ahead and do that, rinse that tank until it rinses clean or runs clean. It's my recommendation that you do that every single time you take the unit out. Now, if you are easily sidetracked, you may forget what you're doing here. Go ahead and leave that black water valve in the open position. That's going to keep you from being able to overflow that tank. You're not going to get that excellent rinsing action, but that's going to be better than, again, potentially overflowing that tank. Uh, again, moving on further, uh, we have a couple all-weather outlets here, nothing too crazy, just a couple 15 amp outlets. So we have an outside shower port here. Now this is going to utilize a quick disconnect uh, coupler. Uh, with any quick connect coupler, you have a locking collar that you go ahead and you slide back. Uh, from there, you're going to go ahead and insert the male end fully. Uh, once fully inserted, that's going to automatically snap back. Once, it, once connected, it's going to automatically pressurize that hose for use. Excellent pairing here with the outside kitchen with the sink here. Uh, it's going to work well for you or again, you know, just for general use. You want to wash your feet off, whatever, wash your critters off, whatever. It's going to work well for that. Uh, very easy to use and again is a very excellent addition. Uh, what we have here is going to be a standard uh, camping stove cooktop. Uh, this works very well. It ties into your existing propane supply using this hose. Now it's going to again utilize a series of quick connect uh, quick connect fittings to do so. Uh, before showing you further, I just want to kind of show you this valve here. So you slide that back, you're going to insert the male end, which is of course not this end, but it would look very similar to this. You're going to insert that fully. Once you're fully inserted, that snaps back, and then we would turn it on with the valve there. Now when you're connecting this, you're going to take this uh, female end, and you're going to connect it to the male end here on the underside. So you have the end there and we would just again do what I just told you, told you to connect there. Now we're going to take the male end and we're going to connect it here on the camper connection. So again you have that very same uh, connector that we saw there and we're going to insert the male end fully until it locks and we're going to go ahead and turn, not only turn the valve on here but we're going to turn the valve on here as well. Now when going down the road it is very important that we do go ahead and put this dust cap back uh, in its location that's going to help uh, keep everything nice and clean, keep any road debris from depositing within that fitting, uh, make everything work well. Now uh, this all not only of course folds up and is stored within the compartment, but it is fully removable in the event that you uh, decide that, hey, I haven't been using it, I would rather have the uh, compartment for storage. You have a little bar latch back there, just go ahead and, and remove this, store it in your garage, whatever. Uh, you will find out what makes most sense for you, whether that is to use the kitchen or to not. Uh, just about covers it here on the outside of the camper. We're gonna talk about uh, awning function and, and uh, lights and, and uh, speakers and things like that all there on the inside, uh, but that just about covers it for now. We're gonna hop on the inside and take a look at those features here in just a minute. Alrighty, so here, uh, right inside the entry door, uh, a couple things going on here. We have your first piece for your first piece of safety equipment, which is going to be your fire extinguisher. Uh, it does have a green test tab, and it is important that we do test our safety equipment every single time before taking the unit out. Green test tab. Go ahead and push it down. If it springs back, that means the unit has life in it. It's fair, it's ready to use. If that green button were to stay depressed, we need to go ahead and pull the unit out and replace it. Uh, also, right here inside the door, we have your road vac. A uh, couple of ways to operate that. Of course, you can go ahead and uh, attach a hose there to that orifice. It uh, does not include that hose kit, but if you find out that you really like this and it's uh, worth it, you can go ahead and upgrade to that hose kit. It does have an on-off switch here. Uh, I'm not going to turn it on because it's going to be really loud there on the mic. Uh, same with down here. So this, is a, a, uh, this has an opening drawer there. What that does is the idea is you can go ahead and you can um, sweep your, uh, with a broom, go ahead and sweep your debris towards this area. You go ahead and lift it up. It's going to go ahead and suck it up like a dustpan. Uh, does have a uh, bag back behind this, this, this panel. So we go ahead and, and put our finger in there. That's going to allow us to open it there. 
Uh, take note of the bag before you throw it away. That way you know which one you need to replace it. Uh, here on the other side, we have your converter fuse panel breaker box. Uh, what we have here is your automotive blade style replaceable fuses there on the right. That's going to be for your 12 volt appliances. On the left there, we have your light switch style breakers. Uh, those are going to be your 110 volt appliances. They are resettable. Probably have seen these before, possibly in your fuse box at home. Everything in terms of function is labeled right there on the door for both of those power sources. Uh, hopping up here within the units, uh, coming here into the kitchen, we have your standard, uh, again, basic kind of camping stove cooktop. Uh, same variant we saw outside. It's going to operate the very same way in terms of function as the one we uh, saw outside. This one does have a tempered glass top, though, so... It goes without saying that this is not a griddle, this is not a cooktop. It is very important that we go ahead and let these burners cool down uh, before closing this lid. It's tempered glass. I've seen them misused. I've seen them broken because of it. So keep that in mind. Uh, kitchen area, of course, you have this single bowl sink. Nothing too crazy. Uh, access to hot and cold water. Uh, nice nice uh, countertop extender there. It's going to give you a little bit of space if you're prepping a meal. Uh, or whatever, uh, you can go ahead and use that. Uh, large amounts of storage and cabinetry, uh, again, within the unit. Uh, nothing that we really need to focus on too much, uh, but you do have a couple USBs here for charging. Uh, that's going to be an excellent upgrade. And then you also have a couple 110 volt outlets there uh, for, for, again, powering uh, you know coffee pot, whatever you choose here in the kitchen area uh, to power. Uh, we have your three-way high point uh, microwave convection grill here. Uh, does work on all of these functions here. So you have a convection option, you have a grill option, roast. Um, on the inside, we have a heating element up top. Uh, works like a toaster oven. Again, using this uh, grated tray there, it's going to work like a convection. Also does have a turntable to run it like a traditional microwave. Operation of this unit is uh, very indicative of what you are generally going to see with a microwave. Uh, you can choose your source up top here. You have uh, time uh, and temperature set here. Does come with the service manual, although I find most of my customers can work themselves around the unit uh, with just looking at it. So, uh, down below we have your Dometic three-way refrigerator. Uh, does run on all three power source. What that means is runs on 12 volt DC runs on propane gas, and also runs on 110 volt electricity. Could it be easier to select your power source uh, because you just go ahead and push the button, on off button here, and then press the corresponding uh, power source. Now, if I go ahead in here and put it in propane gas, you can see it uh, alarming to me. That's just saying that it's not sensing any propane flowing through the line. Uh, in the event that this happens to you, and it will most likely happen to you, you're gonna wanna go ahead and push that uh, reset button there and that's going to send it into another lighting cycle. Generally it will try and light for a certain amount of time. If it does not end, uh, light by the end of that lighting cycle it's going to go ahead and uh, alarm to you. We also have your temperature control here uh, which of course the more bars you see the cooler it is. Um, again super super easy to work around. Uh, here on the inside of course you get the fancy blue lighting you have the flip down ice box, which is removable. Directions to do so are right there on the front of it. We also have this door hold open. So if I go ahead and uh, slide that out, that door hold open is going to keep that door from closing. That's designed for use uh, in storage. So what that does is keep this door from closing all the way, keeps it from getting musty or mildewy there on the inside. It's going to work out perfect. Uh, make sure you do leave that door open when storing it. Uh, other than that, again, very straightforward, very easy way, uh, easy to navigate through, um, shouldn't give you any issues. Uh, coming over here, a lot going on on this wall space. Starting up, uh, our pods are now wired from Forest River, pre-wired for uh, the addition of a rooftop solar panel. Excellent feature. What this sticker is noting here is that this is where you would uh, install the charge controller, even gives you a little pattern to cut that out. Uh, those rooftop, that run of wires, uh, terminates at this location. So that's what that sticker's noting. If we drop down here, we have your main 
uh, switch cluster here. Uh, this is going to control most of your lights, interior and exterior, as well as that your slide out controls, awning, things like that. Excuse me. Um, interior lights on here, on off, that's going to control just about every interior light we have. Uh, you can control which lights come on with that switch. Each light does have an independent switch. Again, you can control which lights come on with that switch. Uh, porch light here, that's going to be that amber colored light we saw on the exterior of the unit. Uh, again, it's, it's a less intrusive amber colored light. Uh, works well to light that porch area. Uh, makes it a very usable space. Awning lights, uh, since your awning it has, a, a, it has an LED light strip uh, along the, the edge of that awning, uh, because you can't see it unless you're outside, you don't want to accidentally turn the switch on uh, and then have it remain on, uh, potentially killing your battery. So they go ahead and put it on a lighted switch, which is a great idea. Uh, we have your slide room in and out switch here. Now, um, may have mentioned this here on the outside, but again, this unit is going to utilize that Schwintech system. What that is, is it's two independently geared motors pushing that slide in and out. Because, of its two, because it's two independently geared motors, uh, what we're looking to avoid is any short burst or any partial opening. So come fully in. If we're going in, go fully out. If we're going out, uh, avoid short bursts. It can actually bind that slide in its opening and then it's not going to move in or out. So avoid short bursts, fully in, fully out. The uh, slide system is equipped with an electric brake. So once it reaches that resting position, that motor is going to automatically stop. You're going to hear it stop. That's your indicator that you are fully in or fully out. Uh, awning extend and retract. Now this uh, uses a momentary switch. Um, so, you know, it's not what we would consider a one touch awning. You're going to fully extend that. With these particular awnings, you know when it's fully extended because that fabric is going to be slightly loose the whole time it's going out. It's going to reach a point where it tightens up. That's the fully extended point. If we go a little bit further than that, it's going to droop down again. So you know you're right at the right location when that fabric is nice and taut. Um, other than that, uh, dropping down low, we have your bathroom lights. Uh, now this is, of course, controls that bathroom light, but that light also does have a switch right there on the fixture. Uh, feel free to operate it in either capacity. Uh, jumping over here to your courtesy panel, this is going to give you a real-time readout of where your tanks, uh, your, your tanks sit in level of full. We have your battery here. Uh, of course, that's gonna, that reads full. That's going to read full anytime we are plugged into short power. To get an accurate reading of that battery, we do need to unplug and go ahead and test from here. We have your fresh water holding tank there that is full. We have pressurized that system, went through all the fixtures, make sure everything is uh, working correctly. We have your black water tank, which is empty as it should be. Gray water is empty as it should be. Uh, water pump switch here. Uh, now, both of these switches are lighted, the water heater and the water pump. Uh, so you know when they're on. Uh, again, that water pump is designed to draw that water up from that potable water tank to the fixture and make it usable. We have your water heater switch here. Um, now, when I go ahead and turn that water heater light, you're going to see this fault light come on with it. That fault light is going to flicker on and off initially while it's going through its lighting cycles. If we come back five minutes later and that fault light is still on, then that means that water heater has not lit. Uh, reason for it not to light could be a multitude of different things. Either you're out of propane gas completely, you don't have the valve on, or oftentimes it just takes a little bit of time for the, for the propane to, front go to flow from the tank to the appliance. In the event that, that you come back five minutes later and that fault light is on, uh, go ahead and of course check, make sure your valve's open, make sure you have gas. If you have both of those things, just turn the switch off, turn it back on, it is going to recycle another three times. And again, just a reminder, we talked about the location of the 110 volt heating element for the water heater on the exterior of the unit. This switch is for that propane side with that direct spark ignition. Beside that, we have your Dometic thermostat. Now this utilizes a captive touch. Uh, these buttons can may or may not be as responsive as you'd like. I promise you pushing harder on that does not make it work better. It is a captive touch, uh, so that could be slightly unreliable, uh, but it does generally work fairly well. Um, so when we go ahead and turn it on, we first have to choose a fan speed, and this is 
talking about air conditioner fan speed. Uh, our choices are low, high, and auto. So if we chose low or high, that fan on the air conditioner is going to run indefinitely. Uh, even if our next selection is going to be thermo, uh, it's going to be furnace. That fan is going to run indefinitely. So to keep it right with us and having it automatic shut off once it's reached that thermostatic temperature, we need to put it in auto there. So once we've confirmed that fan speed, it's going to take us into that air conditioner mode, which is denoted by the snowflake there. It's telling us our fan speed again, which is auto, and the thermostat is set to 72 degrees. If I want to change that, I have arrows here to uh, up that up or down. If I hit that one more time, it's going to kick on the furnace. Uh, once it realizes what I'm doing and catches it up, it's going to kick that blower motor off or kick that air conditioner fan off immediately. Uh, from there, <clears throat> uh, that blower motor comes on immediately. 16 seconds after that, it ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. In a unit of this size, I would not be overly surprised if it does in fact set off the smoke alarm. Uh, that is acceptable from the manufacturer's standpoint within the first 15 minutes of operation. Uh, the longer you operate the unit, the efficiency goes up. Shouldn't uh, set off the smoke alarm uh, after that point. So just keep that in mind. Uh, next up selection on that is going to be off. So we're, we're kind of done talking about the thermostat there. And we're going to talk about the bathroom a little bit. So what you have here is a wet bath. You have a, a small sink with a diverter uh, to allow you to use that same water source for the shower. Shower has an on and off uh, on the fixture. Uh, that's going to help you conserve your water supply. You'll find yourself with most campers doing military Navy style showers. Uh, what that's going to entail is getting wet, turning the water off, lathering up, turning it off again, rinsing it off, uh, so on and so forth. All in the event of conserving not only your hot water, but your overall water supply. Uh, other than that, talked about the light and the switch. We have a fan here on the inside. Now that its resting position should be locked, so that, that locking is, is pushing that straight up. So in this case, we're trying to open it. We're going to pull down to unlock it. I'm going to rotate that uh, to go ahead and open it. And then I have four fan speeds here. As long as I go there through the fan speeds, you can see that start to rotate. Uh, that is an exhaust fan that's going to help pull any moisture from the shower again when you are showering. Uh, fan off here, biggest thing with that. Uh, we do want to make sure we do go ahead and close that before going down the road. Probably not going to be there when you get to where you're going if you forget. Uh, once we close it, we lock it, we're good to travel. Now with these wet baths, of course you see the shower curtain hanging here, you of course have the door. Most of the time, uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be your best option to go ahead and shower uh, with the door open. That's going to give you kind of room to, to actually do your business. Sitting in there with the door closed, it is a very tight space, uh, so keep that in mind. Flush is going to be on the right side of the bowl, left side if you're sitting on it. It's going to be a light pool to fill up that bowl. Always want to keep some water in the bowl. That's going to help keep the bad smells down when you do go ahead and flush. Uh, and then it's going to be a full pool towards you to flush. Uh, now you want to use a single ply RV grade toilet paper. Very, very important. Uh, or And also paired with a chemical treatment, whether that's a deodorizer or tissue dissolver or a combination of both. If you have any questions on what toilet paper to use, what products to use, feel free to go ahead and contact our parts department. Uh, again, they'd be more than happy to educate you on which products are going to be best for your black water holding tank uh, within these units. Uh, just about covers it here in the bathroom, and we are going to move on. Uh, down low, something I didn't talk about earlier is we have your second piece of safety equipment there. That's going to be your carbon monoxide LP leak detector. Uh, what that is going to do for you is it is going to alarm you of uh, the presence of any of those gases. It uses a series of light flashes to do so, and the scale is written right on the appliance. It does have a test button. We want to test it again every time we take the unit out. It is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper, uh, so there is no battery to change. Just again, make sure it is in good working order uh, before taking the unit out. Uh, before I forget, Smoke alarm up top here, does run on a nine volt battery, your last piece of safety equipment. Again, does sound like a broken record, check it every single time you take the unit out. Make sure you have a battery replacement. Uh, if you're like me, that battery, that alarm's gonna start chirping at the most inopportune time. 
3 a.m., whatever. Uh, of course, it's not going to be my recommendation to remove that battery. Keep a spare with you to keep you from having to do so. Uh, what else we have? Uh, we have your main GFI receptacle down here on the floor. Now, all the receptacles within the unit are on the same circuit. That's going to be the reset point. Uh, very much like your bathroom at home, there's going to be a test button as well as a reset button. Uh, and if you don't have functionality to your receptacles, more than likely, you need to reset it there. Um, turning around here, we have your Firon unit. Um, now this is going to give you Bluetooth connectability as well as, uh, a oh, as well as AM FM radio. Uh, we also have uh, inlets here. So we not only have 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and auxiliary inputs, we have uh, HDMI input and a USB input. Now the HDMI input direct connects this to the television. So if you're utilizing any streaming services or anything like that, uh, you can kind of use this as a hub to do so to feed that uh, into the television. So it's uh, going to work well. I find, again, that most people in this day and age can really work themselves around these uh, units. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is we have two zones of speakers. Zone 1 is going to be the inside speakers. Zone 2 is going to be the exterior speakers. We saw those on the outside. You do control each volume separate uh, with that zone. So select the zone here on the top display. Dial that volume up or down, you'll be good to go. Uh, closet space here, uh, drawers, again, nothing too uh, crazy to speak of. I'm going to go ahead and uh, unbuckle this TV. Now, I'm not sure if you caught that, but TV is buckled in going down the road. It, of course, is very important that we do so. That's going to keep it from flopping out. But when we want to watch it, say, sitting on the couch or, or, you know, within the kitchen, we go ahead and pull it out here into the living space. Just like any other TV has a button there on this side uh, to turn it on and off. Does have a remote, uh, just functions very much like any other TV you've ever seen. Now I'm going to kind of pull this out of the way. I'm going to switch places with Clint. We're going to talk about that antenna booster there. Uh, so you have a red light there on that antenna booster. What that red light notes is that uh, you have a uh, antenna on the roof and that it means that the antenna is on. Now it's an omnidirectional digital over the air antenna and that uh, is, is again powered by that booster plate there. Now we saw the cable satellite inlets on the outside of the camper. What happens is that antenna and those, that, the, the RG6 line, they, same, that's, they share that same pathway. So what that means is if you see that red light, that signal for those, that, that, that cable, part cable service, is not going to bleed through the line. So if we're utilizing a park cable service, we need to push that button, which is directly by that red light, to turn that red light off and, and turning that antenna booster itself off, and that's going to allow that cable signal to bleed through. Now when it comes to using it, we just turn it on, we do a channel search, it's going to do all the legwork, it's going to seek out that best signal, bring that in accordingly, uh, bring any over-the-air television in uh, according to that. Um, this area here is going to also make a bed. Uh, to do so, we are going to remove these cushions here. And then we would go ahead and take our tabletop, which is on the uh, bed right next to Clint there, and we're going to set it on these ledges here. Uh, nothing too crazy. It is just a standard kind of card table design with the foldable legs. Uh, you know, really, again, very, very basic, very, very easy to do. Uh, sure, you can work around it, but if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call. We can further walk you through. Uh, some things we didn't talk about is going to be fire exit. Fire exit, if your entry door is blocked, is going to be here at this location. Uh, you have these latches here. If you're particularly motivated enough, undo the latches. Go ahead and exit the unit from that location. Uh, again, if the entry door is blocked, that's really your, your, your best option. Uh, all of the windows, including the emergency exit, are going to open the same way. You have a lift tab here. You pull that, slide that uh, to the opening. Uh, works great. Screen. Uh, use the fan to go ahead and get a cross breeze going. Whatever. Uh, it is very usable. Uh, your privacy shade is there. That's a friction-based shade or a tension-based shade. The amount of tension here on the strings allows that to hold open when it's not in use. As these age, they may start to droop down on their own. Feel free to unscrew this, loosen it, 
pull a little bit string, pull a little bit more string through, tie a knot, tie a new knot, and you're good to go until it stretches out again. Will stretch out is just in here of the design. I uh, really think I just about hit everything here on the inside of the unit. Uh, we do hope you enjoyed this walkthrough on the RPOD 179. Again, if you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Thank you very much.